All right. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jean Christopher Chamcho. He was born in Cameroon. Also lived in Sweden. Has been here for a while, enjoying our ice fishing, which he says is <laughs> so much better than what they have in Sweden. <laughs> Uh, he's got a little uh, map, so he's going to tell you more about where the, the triad of his life and all the great places he's lived. I think that's going to be pretty fantastic. Um, I'm very happy to have so many people here today. He's going to talk about natural dietary products for managing skin diseases, opportunities and challenges in psoriasis. Now, he was pronouncing it. How did you pronounce psoriasis? So, so, psoriasis. Psoriasis. So as, as a way to help him and all of you, and because I've been dying to tell this joke, <laughs> the Eskimos coming across the ice sheet suffering from snow blindness sees a big clinic in the distance and says, oh my goodness, a site for psoriasis. <laughs> Can we talk afterwards how to hone that down? <laughs> Maybe I should say sees a hospital. Hospital, is that the... Yeah. No, no, clinic? Right. Clinic? Right. Okay, good. <laughs> and remember, this is my day job. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Jean Christopher to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Good evening and welcome. Um, I want to thank Tony and the others who uh, asked me to come here and share with us, um, discuss what we think about how we can prop um, ingredients that are found in the food we consume per day and on everyday basis to manage conditions that um, exist within us, especially in the most exposed and the, most, and the largest organ of the human body. Uh, as a, a courtesy, this is not, it's, we're not talking about fruit market or the farmer's market, but there is a lot of repertoire of ingredients that are found in all of these fruits that we consume, including food that we consume. Uh, but sometimes the way we consume them and the way we use them will determine whether this food uh, or the chemicals are available. <laughs> Seems you're not getting me. Could be bioavailable, that is, they are available to perform the function in which they're supposed to perform or to provide a treatment um, advantage. Can you hear me, please? So, um, I do not have any conflict to declare. We are seated here uh, just right below this large dot, and I was born in this triangle. I don't know whether it's by virtue of chance that this is becoming a triangle. This is how I'm revolving. And I was born and raised here, started my education here, and then moved up here to this other <coughs> obvious shape that looks like another triangle. And then from there, I moved to this other position where we are standing right now. So this country is known as Cameroon. It is centrally located in the coast of West Africa. And my father came from this red area called the West Region, and my mother came from this other part called the Southwest Region, which together with the Northwest Region are the two major English-speaking regions of the nation. Uh, we always hear that this is a bilingual country, or some people know it as a French country. It's as a result of most of the population being 80% being French-speaking. But today, I was surprised 10 years ago that uh, it's becoming more and more bilingual and people are using both English and French. And so my dad moved here and found uh, a sweetheart, as I have also done somewhere. And then they grew up here and I was born in this area. Did my secondary, primary, elementary, secondary and higher education. And then I was catapulted back to this area where I did my university uh, bachelor's degree. After that, <clears throat> My uncle who adopted me flew me to Sweden, the red map you see here in Europe, northern Europe. It's a very cold place. Uh, it's colder than Madison, but I think living in Sweden and coming to Madison is like second home for transition. It, it would have been worse going to Washington or to, or, or to Arizona. 
So um, there in Sweden, uh, my uncle lived here in North in Lean Shopping, which is not shown, but we have uh, close to North Shopping, which is on the Lean Shopping Commune, where I did my master's in biomedicine, and then moved to Uppsala, which is very close, just 40 minutes close to Stockholm, which everybody, almost everyone knows about Stockholm yet. But I did my graduate studies in Uppsala University. So today, uh, because of the audience, I, I, I wonder if I'm going to be able to break it down, but let's go together. Please interject and ask me what I mean by a term that you don't understand. Um, I will give us a brief overview of the skin and skin disease, and, and then I will transition into introduction on using natural product for treating skin disease. I will give us a brief overview of what is known as uh, immune cell, that is, um, the defense mechanism of the body, of, this, of the body, they uh, do undergo what's known as um, skin disease uh, mediated as a result of those. Some of these disease today, it's not only psoriasis, but I'll give you an example of it. And how we can define molecular target. We always see that you want to cure something, but do you have to cure something when you don't know the cause of the thing? So uh, we look at the molecular target. What is the molecular defect that causes the disease? If we know the molecular defect, then we'll be able to target the disease. Understanding the biology of the disease, we can be able to use whatever means that we have on uh, using different technologies that we know in combination to design therapies. And then in this case, we're going to use uh, plant-derived um, chemicals, and then um, I've been working with two dimensions that is in tissue culture, and I've been regenerating skin, normal skin, as well as psoriatic or other skin diseases. And then use, we're gonna to try to see as far as we can go, some of these small molecules such as definidine, green tea, polyphenol, EG, specifically EGCG, and 513. Then conclusion and um, acknowledgement. Yes. <clears throat> when we look at pictures like this, we all talk like, what, what is a black guy doing there? It's not about being celebrity or being someone of this color. The problem here is that the skin is the same. But due to a small um, change in molecular mechanism or due to the phylogenetic um, development because some of the black skin originated at the equator, you know the equator? Uh, I forgot to show that in that map. That's where the sun solar radiation is very high. So by, I don't know whether it's by serendipity or it's by God's um, gracious made. People who come from those area have developed through genealogy some mechanism in which they protect from solar radiation. And this comes from innate in the skin that they do possess some cells that uh, we call them melanocytes that do have the capacity to absorb more of the solar radiation. That is why they can actually be exposed to that uh, um, to solar radiation in that area, and this will reduce the incidences of skin condition. Whereas some of us, like now that I'm enjoying coming from that equator and I'm enjoying this weather, I wonder why God didn't make my color to change back to the light skin. <laughs> but, but I don't know. I cannot question God. Maybe it's just an, an irreversible reaction. So, however, whatever the skin type, it is the largest organ and the most exposed organ of the human body. The skin, as we know, is the largest organ. In an average, sorry, I'm using two computers. Now I get confused, Tom. In an average adult, the skin constitutes 13 kilograms. That is about 80% of the total body weight, and average is about two square meter. If the skin is peeled and stretched out, average is about two square meter. Yeah, this is so funny because like, I'm not even just having this kind of area. How come my skin can cover up to about two square meters? So the, um, when we look at the out, outer part of the skin, like the facial skin we saw, it looks very simple, right? But um, right? on this cross section shows the top part of the skin. You see how smooth it is. But once we go underneath, we, we see that it reveals a very complex structure. The structure that is made up of different compartments that's composed of three major compartments. From the outside in is the epidermis, 
which is the major cell target. It consi consists of a kind of cell type, the major cell type that provide us with the barrier potential that <coughs> mosquito bite or when we have accident or pressure, it protects the internal organ. So that first barrier is being uh, compounded or provided by that keratinocyte, which constitutes about 80 to nine, uh, 85 to 90 percent of keratinocyte. Then we also have melanocytes, that's pigment, uh, pigment producing cell. Langerhan cell and the immune sentinel cells known as the macro cell. On the line, um, on the, line the epidermis is the dermis, which, is, um, which ranges between one, one millimeter at the level of the eyelid to about four millimeter at the level of the back. And it is dense elastofibrous connective tissue that consists mainly the cell contents are fibroblasts, which are mesenchymal cells, this and some immune cells such as macrophages and different lymphocytes. So you see why the skin is becoming more and more interesting is that it's not just an isolated organ. It has everything. It has immunology, which means it's coming from the blood. So, so now we're seeing that some of those cells are there as resident cells, but we expect to see them in the blood. Then on the line, the dermis is the subcutis, that is the hypodermis, that basically consists of the adipose tissue that uh, it protects us with insulation, provides insulation. And we can see that in, within all this structure are embedded different organs, hair follicles, hair papillae, nerve fibers, and different blood vessels in the skin. So this makes it an entire organ by itself. So how does, how does the skin provide us with this barrier, whether it's immunological? So the skin provides the body with two types of barrier, physical, that's protect from any physical as well as an immunological barrier. So if there is compromise in this barrier, this will lead to dysfunction of, of the skin. This will lead to dysfunction of the skin and it can result to infection in terms of acquired or in terms of uh, acquired uh, conditions such as genetic mutation would also lead to compromise and skin fragility. In terms of um, acquired factor, you would have other diseases such as psoriasis, although psoriasis now is known to have both genetic and acquired background. So um, simplistically, we can represent this barrier component of the skin, how it forms. Keratin intermediate filament interacts with the cell membrane at the, demo, at the, at the, desmo, at the level of either the desmo, desmosome or corneal desmosome, depending on the layer of the skin. The next molecule that comes is a filament aggregating protein. This filament aggregating protein condense and aggregate keratin intermediate filament, thereby preparing a scaffold for another biochemical enzyme, transglutaminase, that will provide the consolidation of this uh, moiety. Following that comes loricrine, which, is, which consists about 85% uh, 85 of the total mass of the epidermis. After that comes um, the transglutaminases that would cross link from the cast scaffold. So it's a consolidation that is well organized and well structured. Following that comes the proteases. Proteases are other enzymes that are responsible for modulating the skin hydration. That is why you see sometimes we say we have dry skin and then we're suffering from skin dryness and so on. So the key regulators of these skin dryness are proteases. An example that is defective, that is abnormal, down-regulated in psoriasis is caspase 14. I will refer to these most of the time when we look at investigation, when we're doing treatment. So following that comes the lipid bilayers that comes and form the bilayers that provide the complete impervious um, nature of the epidermis of the skin. However, several of these barrier structure components that I've described have been found to be genetically abnormal in several skin conditions, not only including geno geno genetic skin diseases, but also including some skin conditions that do have both genetic as well as acquired factors, such as atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, I guess I pronounced it this time correctly, <laughs> it shows it's an asthma and uh, mislocalization or uh, expression of these proteins have provided clues to the uh, molecular basis of several of these skin conditions. 
Another important area of the skin is the dermis, as I described, the one to four millimeter. Uh, this is the epidermis and this is the dermis. But there is an important area that is very important for us, especially when we grow starting from little crease and then we start growing to my age and getting aged. There is something that happened in this area called the dermal and epidermal junction. It is the most important area of the, of the skin. If we, if we lack this area, then we don't have skin. The top part of the skin will fall off. So this looks very simple, but schematically it looks a very complex structure. It's complex and well organized, starting from the top part or the basal lamina, intercalating structural proteins that interact with each and every one of the structural proteins in a very well organized manner. As you can see here, the different collagens that are found deep in the dermis, and here is the dermal uh, epidermal complex, and here is this um, uh, basal, la uh, basal layer of the epidermis. And it is known that um, genetic abnormalities in any, in all of these structural proteins have led to clinical phenotype of skin conditions that are very devastating. And most of us uh, have seen this one way or the other type. In a nutshell, either by true inheritance or true acquired factor, uh, several of these skin conditions will lead to clinical phenotypes that look like this. Um, this will range from a simple bacterial infection through genetic condition that affects skin uh, areas such as the nail. Here you see collagen mutation that leads to erosion of the skin. So that's collagen, one of the structural proteins I just showed in the demo epidermal junction. Absence of it due to congenital defect would lead to erosion. Through the racial skin conditions, the keloid and hypertrophic scars. And then we can also see that even infection by... Um, um, parasitic infection as well as drug-induced eruption. There is teeth and hair epidemic dysplasia, hair involvement. So it, abnormalities in any of these ways will give us a, a huge spectrum of skin condition. And our issue is how do we understand it and how do we design um, ways to treat them? Some of them are congenital and some of them are acquired. Some of them are both. So um, for the past nine years, I've been working with HOCs and EBS, and, and recently, since 2010, I moved, I just shifted a little bit to psoriasis and other skin disease. It's the same area. You just need to understand the first few cartoons, and then you can shift. It's not really complicated, but some people ask me, how could you do this? So you see keratinocyte staining green keratin. This green staining, the blue is the nucleus of the cell and then the keratin intermediate filament is green. You can see that this filament does radiate from uh, the green one, radiate all around the nucleus, stained blue, extending throughout the cellular cytoskeleton. This is an extracted cell, and right up to the microextension. This is known as keratin, keratin intermediate filament, and they, are major, they form the major uh, structural uh, uh, component of the skin. Sorry, this slide in this one is not good and the major components of skin, hair, nails, teeth, and other epithelia, both internal and external. And they represent a family of more than 54 proteins that uh, form more, uh, heterodimer, tetramer, and then leading to condensation to form a strong 10 to 12 nanometer intermediate filament that provides us with this, our nice nature of the skin that protects, with, uh, protects us from uh, intrusion. So what happens? When we have uh, skin conditions such as chronic inflammatory skin disease, um, these are um, immune cell mediated skin disease. A couple of years ago, we were talking about psoriasis as a different one, but T cell mediated skin disease are a proportion of total skin disease. They include inflammatory and, and cancerous, cancerogenous skin conditions, which range from either a simple rash through sunburn and then which will lead to con chronic condition. Example of them are dermatitis, any f of the form of dermatitis, and here you call it eczema. Uh, um, either the contact, the atopic or the normal form. The other one is psoriasis, which is our topic of today. And then we have other forms of uh, blood cancer that, uh, um, that uh, uh, effectuate the cell on the skin. So in 2013, out of the um, 85 million Americans who visited a physician for one or the other kind of skin problem, 35 million were affected by 
um, a common skin problem, which are the major problems in dermatology. And this prevalence exceeds both that of cardiovascular disease as well as diabetes. And this generated um, a direct health care cost of $75 billion with an indirect uh, lost opportunity of over $11 billion. So, and what happens is that acute, acute inflammation, that is, if you run in, you can hit your body somewhere, you can just get an acute inflammation. It's um, typically resolved quickly without tissue destruction. But chronic inflammation is long-lasting and can cause substantial uh, tissue destruction, which is the case with some of these uh, inflammatory skin diseases. So if we take a hypothetical as an example of uh, a patient presenting his or herself in a clinic with lesions that ranges from, <coughs> excuse me, lesions that ranges from one centimeter flat patch to two centimeter raised plaque in a silver-looking background and a background of erythema. It's identified as psoriasis. Psoriasis is a disease that can affect all part of the skin without any exception. You can see psoriasis of the, of the feet, the knees, flexural region, postular psoriasis, the psoriasis of the, um, affecting the, the joints in psoriatic arthritis. You can see even nail, tattoo excision, and tattoo skin as well as in co nerve phenomenon. If we biopsy this, this biopsy, can somebody tell what biopsy? If you take, if you, yeah, if you take skin biopsy of the unaffected skin as well as that of the affected skin in blue and in red, we observe that compared to the unaffected skin, the normal skin to the left that shows a very thin epithelium, the psoriatic skin lesion shows a, an increase in epidermal uh, proliferation of keratinocyte, increase in red ridges, as well as abnormal differentiation. In addition to this, we see the infiltration of immune cells right to the stratum conium, the top part of the skin, as well as mixed infiltration of immune cells here, which you see very few of them, just the resident ones are there, but you see that the influx is very high here. So psoriasis is defined as the, as the most common chronic and the most common chronic but also incurable uh, inflammatory skin condition which in some cases affects the joint and it is its etiology is not is incompletely understood but it is generally known to uh, be as a result of an inter interface be interaction between uh, skin cells and the immune cells so abnormal interaction between skin cells have been have driven psoriasis pathology. So it is essentially a disease of the Caucasian affecting about 25, 125 million people in the world with up to 8 million in the United States alone. So what statistic we have? Out of the 1,000 skin conditions, we have uh, 35 million people having 23 of the recognized one. And out of 23, psoriasis alone, not including atopic, atopic dermatitis, uh, accounts for 8 million. This means uh, this represents a public health condition. And this condition is less seen in Asians and is very rarely seen in Africans. Because of the severity of the case you have seen like in the picture, more than 30% of our patients uh, contemplate suicide, which is normal. If you've seen the previous slide, it sounds normal for anybody who would think like, I better not leave than to leave. But not to worry. Even the food we eat can help us to manage these situations. So this will leave the family uh, as well as the patient suffering with similar and um, place this disease in, major, in line with other major conditions such as heart, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So the common, common drugs that are used today will only help in relieving inflammation. They, they include things like corticosteroid. Uh, but they are typically used for short term because when they are used for long term, they do, they do have some adverse uh, uh, um, conditions that are detrimental to the skin, such as increased skin thinning, immunosuppression, and impair ad adrenal gland fun uh, function of uh, adrenal gland, as well as hyperglycemia. So in the absence of, so we know today that there are drug companies that have produced very good injectable drugstores such as Sterola, is best schemas and so on. 
But the problem is that patients who suffer from these conditions, when they are treated, they do complain a lot about the adverse reactions that come from this injection. The lesion could be relieved, but there is too much complaint about the pain, the suffering they, uh, they have due to injection, and so on. So what should we do? We thought that we could turn to look at the natural uh, plant and see what we can do because some of these plants, especially those that are already accepted by us, the humans, that is, we consume them on a daily basis, we could exploit them and find out if this, comp this plant possess some medication in them. And if they do, how can we use the medication in treating different kind of diseases? They are different. In case of um, cardiovascular conditions, maybe just consuming some of these compounds or in form of fruits could help. But does it really help in skin because skin is well exposed is the question and how can we go about this is what we are about to look at. So we hypothesized that um, any natural plant compound that has the ability to slow down or to um, um, diminish increase proliferation as we've seen, reduce inflammation and or even increase the differentiation that is increased normal thinning of the skin would be useful for the treatment of psoriasis as well as other hyperproliferative skin diseases such as the T, uh, T, TSD. So the objective of this work was to investigate whether small a uh, natural plant-derived product could be developed as novel agents for the manif uh, management of psoriasis. How did we do those? We had um, three major objectives. First, we wanted to see what would happen in normal keratinocyte using these plant-derived compounds. In normal skin cells, which is the major one, keratinocyte, as we discussed a uh, few minutes ago. And we wanted to see what would happen in 2D cultures, when they are culture in tissue culture, as well as when these cells in the skin, when we, we biopsy the cells in the skin, take them in the lab, disaggregate them, put them in culture, it is good to study them and see what your drug would do. But these cells are not behaving the same like when they are in your skin. So you want to try to grow these cells and tissue engineer the skin in the lab so that the cells should grow and behave like the normal skin that we have. And then we treat the normal skin or the disease skin to understand what the drug is doing to, to that system. So that's the goal. And then the last part of it is to see how this translates to preclinical work. And from that preclinical work, if we have good data, then we can now start to advocate for preclinical for clinical phase trials. So in this study, up to now, we are still up to preclinical uh, evaluation, which is to investigate how they modulate diff, diff, and how if they can alleviate disease uh, uh, phenotype. So how do we go about this? Generally, uh, identification and validation, of, uh, and validation of, of drug for drug discovery starts by identifying the unmet medical needs. If we know that, then we will now turn to understand the molecular mechanism of the disease. We've already seen this. I'm just summarizing this. From there, we can identify the therapeutic target by understanding the molecular mechanism we are understanding the therapeutic target. They could be genes, proteins, as well as they could be enzymes or receptors that are found in, some, in the organ that we are studying. It. And then from there, we have to demonstrate that the target is relevant to the disease by either using a uh, knockdown or genetically modified system. Because we cannot just get medication and start giving to humans. We are higher organism. So we have to show proof of concept throughout several stages before we move to, to the human. Following that, this compound could be screened from, um, uh, lead compound could be screened from collection of uh, compound library, or they could be screened from published literature, or from natural product, which is what we're thinking of today. And we can also do that using recent technologies such as in silico models. After that, we can validate or optimize the proof of concept of this molecule by showing it efficacy in either animal model or using the tissue engineer models. Then following that, we will do the drug, drug-like properties such as pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic, uh, metabolism, and most importantly, the off-target. If, if I give you medication, sometimes, like some of us who don't have a good uh, drinking capacity, alcohol capacity, I give you two bottles of vodka, 
if you are coming from that family that you not you you don't resist that and i say this vodka will treat this headache and it happens that you are in that family then the vodka is going to cause you more harm so we want to know whether the vodka will treat your headache and the adverse effect will be minimal so off targets are very important there is no need for me to give you a medication that have very huge adverse effect so the off targets are also important in this case we can make this medication and produce them develop them in form of micelles nano formulation in terms of skin conditions because it's direct target and for psoriasis i think so rice so rice i think it's it's a good disease because um basically you see that they have um um the top of the lesions have a lot of scales but the skin is denuded it doesn't really have a functional stratum corneum so I think that sometimes designing therapeutics or drugs in form of topical formulation could be good because most of the compounds that we take through food passes through the liver and the liver does a lot of things. The liver will convert the drug or your food that is good to several other molecules that by the time they reach the skin, the potency is very low. And then you keep saying, this is not working for me. But if you could go directly to the skin and do it, then you will know whether this will work. But there are several other routes of administration. So the hypothesis will be that if we get a mechanism based system like in um, atopic dermatitis here and psoriasis, where both of them do have the lack of expression of filagrin and caspase 14 in, the, in this epidermis, if we can prepare a formulation, study that, and apply it either topically and that could induce the expression of <coughs> caspase 14 and filagrin, that will be worthwhile, a good compound to be developed for the for treatment of these diseases. So what I did is that I started off um, getting samples from volunteers and patients and moving back to the lab and skin biopsies from patients, so, uh, either shave biopsies or punch biopsies, uh, all foreskin from newborn. The, this Punch and four skin cells are source for epidermal skin cells. They were all disaggregated, and then we use systematic cell growth system to um, select them, different population, and grow them. The major cell is keratinocyte. So we did those, and then why the shave biopsy cells are some sources for cDNA? Where we use this cDNA to identify the differences between the expression of uh, gene markers for the disease. On the other hand, this initial, these cells were used to initiate culture. We grew them in serum-containing medium and in serum-free medium for reasons that we'll see later, because serum, as we know, many cells grown in culture are grown in 10% serum. But I bet you that in, in situ, the serum content that is found in the epidermis is less than that. It's even turning towards serum-free. So we want to synchronize cells and see whether they behave the same like cells that are grown in serum-containing medium. We then use that and, and, um, in primary, in initial 2D culture, in monolayers, as well as in 3D, we generated first three-dimensional epidemics, then next we then uh, did tissue engineer of the disease, as well as normal skin, using decellularized demis, as well as uh, three-dimensional cell culture insert. We next used two mirror mouse model for psoriasis to test this and we tested these different compounds using cutting edge uh, biochemical and, and molecular biology techniques, we were able to reveal the differences. How do we tissue engineer the system? We get tissue biopsy, disaggregate them, grow them in mono layer, detach them, resuspend them, calculate them, and then reseed them on either the dermal, the, the dermal surface, either the papillary derma or the reticular dermis, depending on what you want and then grow the cells to get confluent and then raise them now to air liquid interface because our body is on air liquid interface. We cannot grow them and submerge. So we raise them to air liquid interface and allow them to grow uh, for tw four to 21 days depending on the objective. So the system here looks uh, simple uh, to the left. This is a PCF system. And to the right, you can see the dec um, decellularized damage here here is where the ring was placed on top of this mesh. And here you can see the air liquid interface. Um, it's glistering, so you can see that it's between uh, water or growth medium. And, and this, 
you can see the system cultural medium underneath and you can see here that this area looks a little bit brighter than this brownish area so after exposing these for over six days we see that re-epitalization is taking place it is brown compared to where the ring was standing where there is no cell so this is a confirmation that the skin is regenerating in vitro so we did that and we obtained in different systems decellularized and poly, uh, polycarbonate cell culture insert a normally developing epithelium in normal keratinocyte. And we have trouble here because I made my presentation in uh, uh, PC. So, and then you see that they show normal development, but in this slide, you see that in the disease model, they reproduce some phenotype of psoriasis. I'm sorry about Mac, I'm not a Mac fan, and this is Mac problem. So how do we go? We investigated the uh, delphinidine, which is a dietary agent that is known, an anti-cancer agent that is known to have antioxidant, importantly, anti-inflammatory and anti-proliferative activity. These two, all these three activities, they take place in psoriasis. Anti-inflammation uh, is involved, hyperproliferation is involved, and there is this oxidoreductive potentials that exist mostly in the, on the epidemics. So definidine is a major uh, pigment compound that is abundantly found in fruits and vegetables that we consume. Today, in addition to other compounds such as vitamin D, which of course uh, UW has a pioneer, uh, DeLuca, who has done a lot of work in vitamin D, that together with its family of uh, anthocyanidin such as cyanidine, uh, pelagonidine, and malvidine, uh, in, the, uh, in the process of being added as uh, part of the amamatarium of the compounds that are being developed for the management of psoriasis. The good thing is that the phenidine is abundantly found in what, is there anything there here that we don't consume at least once in every three days? It's abundantly found in berries, pomegranates, uh, and, and tomato, eggplants, and, and several, all of them are pigmented uh, fruits and vegetables. So they are acceptable. We consume them and we don't sick. We don't get sick. So the first prime is that it's acceptable by human. So how can we explore the acceptability of these uh, ingredients that are found in this plant to be useful for managing adverse health conditions, in, especially in psoriasis in this case? We know that one of the structural molecules that are very important in the skin hydration is caspase 14. Compared to normal skin here to the left, we see that there is diminution of the expression of caspase 14 in psoriatic lesion. And that is in the one that was in red, uh, psoriatic lesion. We then thought of this, and then we generated keratinocyte. We re-engineered skin in vitro using polycarbonate cell culture inserts. And we studied carefully the development of skin starting from four days through 12 days. And we even bypass the time point where there is a normal epithelial regeneration, which is about eight to 10 days. And then we, we observe here that relative to control and drug treatment, this lane is drug treated. You can see that at every developmental stages, the, um, the construct that were regenerated, uh, were treated with delphinidine showed more conspicuous uh, skin structure compared to the control. Then we thought of caspase 14. What is it doing in caspase 14? Look at what we found here. Under normal condition, caspase 14 is induced with increased in differentiation, right? We see here that there's only punctate staining at four days and up to seven days, which increases normally throughout the 10 days of development. But we saw that our bone treatment would, even at four days, there is huge increase in expression of caspase 14. So, sorry, the brown, the browner means increase in the expression and the lighter means less expression. So we see there is increase in this expression. We also use all trans retinoid acid, which is, um, it's also a compound that is used in the clinic. It's clinically used for the management of psoriasis. And there was quite intrigued data that we had until when we went to the disease system, now we understood that this compound is supposed to be used for treatment of psoriasis. We'll see that in a few minutes. So you see there was no effect in the presence of that because it's an, a proliferation inducing agent. But we looked at vitamin D3, which is well known in clinic. It's used in different forms like um, 
uh, it's used to manage this disease. We found also a huge induction of this expression. But what do you see here? The skin morphology doesn't tally with that of the control nor the definidine. The so it does induce it, but it is very rapid and it's very premature. It's good, but it's premature. It doesn't preserve the skin structure. So that is the first time we found out that something may be better in this one compared to that, even though they do the same thing. But we still move forward, and this was normal because we said, why do you give aspirin to somebody? Oh, sorry, I use aspirin now. I forgot. I've been too much in, too long in Europe. Tylenol in America. Why do you give someone Tylenol when he doesn't have any pain? Does it make sense? Okay. But that's what we just did. We gave those skin reconstruct, the previous skin reconstruct, we gave them Tylenol. But they were not sick. But we understood the reason why we did that because we wanted to see what will happen, what it does when the skin is developing. But this time, we did regenerated psoriatic skin in vitro, the disease skin now, compared to that of control skin. What we found is that this is control, and here is the treated skin, and we use positive control, which is vitamin D, which is the well-known compound, and here we use retinoic acid, which is a negative regulator. What we found is that you can see here that there is thinner viral epidermis, which was relative to the, that of vitamin D, but it is thicker um, viral epidermis when treated with retinoid acid. And where we obtained a uh, quantitative analysis showed there was dose dependent decrease in um, ep viral epidermal thickness in, with this drug treatment, which was, uh, which was not tallied with that of retinoid acid and was almost comparable to that of vitamin D3. And also the, the thickness of the stratum conium dose dependently increased. This gave us an astuce that this is a good drug and we need to find, dig deep to find out what's going on. We looked at the protein expression and we found out that proliferation here at control and the drug treated, the brown dots here, increase in brown dots means increased proliferation, increased proliferation and the increase in brown means increase in ionos, inducible nitric oxide synthase. I'm sorry my slide was switched due to the different uh, presentation system. You can see that treatment would, the drug, decrease this brown staining. So we looked at the expression of the effect of this drug on the expression of the, the gene expression of differentiation marker. We started first with caspase 14. What we observe is that compared to control, there was those dependent increase in gene expression of caspase 14. This was almost similar to that of vitamin D3, almost parallel compared to that of retinoid acid, which was not significant. And what we also observed here is the similar, similar pattern was observed in filagrin and other involucrin, another differentiation marker. The protein expression showed relative to control. You can see here that this is, there is normal expression. There's some expression, but treatment with this drug induced, robustly induced this expression. Then we look at detail, the processing. What happened is that um, caspase-14 is a non-apoptotic protease in skin. The good thing is that during my research over the five years, when I started, nothing was really known about this. But every second year, new things are coming up. And some of the data that I thought that were supposed to be dumped, I went to revisit them when I get this from literature. We found out that caspase-14 adds on the precursor of filagrin. Profilagrin. It cleaves profilagrin into filagrin, which is the structural protein that gives us this normal differentiation. But this very caspase 14 recognizes moieties of its pro proteolytic product, which is a filagrin, and then degrades the filagrin into amino acids and urocanic acid. That is where we get a natural moisturizing factor of our skin. So it's a, it's a great molecule to consider when we are looking at skin problems, especially when it concerns skin, hydration, moisture, and so on. And this is why this compound is good in cosmetics, when um, cosmetic researchers are investigating. We looked at normal skin developed after eight days, and you can see here that caspase 14 is activated here uh, on the top. After eight days, this is um, 20 micromolar control. You see, if you compare this lane and this lane, you will agree with me that the amount of protein here is more than this except we do disagree, but that's what I think. And then when we look down in 
uh, this is caspate 14 activation, profilagrin activation. Here, what we see is that at this at control, there is more of profilagrin still left, where in this one, profilagrin is almost finished. So profilagrin is 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 being continually uh, protolyzed in the presence of the drug. When we use the control retinoid acid, nothing was shown, as well as that of vitamin D3, which we don't know. In some cases, vitamin D3 works, and in others, it doesn't. But interestingly, in the psoriasis model, we found the reason, the golden answer, why retinoid acid does work. And that's why I asked that, why do you give a patient Tylenol when he's not complaining of any pain? Let's observe this. Caspase 14 activation control, you see it's incomplete at this number of uh, eight days. But when you treat them, there is dose-dependent activation. This, as you can see, that's, there is increase in this band, dose-dependent increase. Here, instead of nothing that we found here, we found that in the presence of retinoid acid, it was almost like control. In the patient system, it's different from control. And we also observed that there was a retinoid acid, um, vitamin D3, also activates this, although the activation was less than that. We also see a dose-dependent increase in filagrin uh, compared to control, as well as increase in filagrin when treated with, um, with vitamin D3. This, quite, this led us to move further and ask further question. So what is this compound doing? Is it just doing like a magic bullet? No. So we want to find out what the compound is doing. So we went to the industry and we, we screened uh, different kinases, the family of kinases, because these compounds are known to be more kinases. And we were expecting that, just like Uzbekimad and Stelera, that they will be promiscuous in this pathway. We screened this against 102 different families of human kinase. And what we observed is that they were very specific. The first heat that came out showed only 11 of these heat that were strong. And KD determination report knocked out PI, one of the, two of these one, leaving nine of them being positive to follow up. When we did the follow up studies, what we observed is that five of nine of these kinases belong to one signaling pathway. This signaling pathway is known for to be um, uh, regulating protein synthesis, cell growth, survivor, and it's involved in many apoptosis, that is, in many cancer systems. At that time, 2012, nothing was known about this pathway in psoriasis. I went also to dead end. How do I proceed? So the only thing was for me to resolve, I spoke with the dermatopathologist in our department, and they, I said, can we get some samples from the patient? And he said, most definitely. Because I want to find out what's happening. Nobody is talking about it. Does it mean they don't find it and they don't report that they don't find it? So I wanted to find out what's happening. The holy grail is that looking at H&E control, control skin and lesion skin, this is H&E showing the normal psoriasis phenotype. Here we see that compared to this control, there is increased brown staining, this huge induction of the uh, P100 alpha subunit of PI3K. Oh, so can psoriasis become cancer? That started to click in my mind. I was like, okay, God, help me. Then we looked at other... Uh, markers of this pathway, looking at all the isoforms that are activated. The green here shows the expression pattern of this protein that is upregulated in, in, the, in the, whether it's upregulated in the disease compared to that of control or it's downregulated. And down here is the mass control skin, that is normal skin. What we observe here in the green is that there is huge induction of all of these markers in the skin lesion. And that set the stage of a new, diff a new molecular marker for psoriasis. That's not the end. My goal is to look for treatment. So we proceed. Journey continues. We looked for two different mouse models. I'm going to skim this very fast. We looked at the flaky skin mouse model, which is not a very good model. At that time, it was the best for, for my work. But I'm going to skim over it, and we can talk, discuss that in the discussion time. So in this mouse model, seem to have a genetic uh, characterization that has some of uh, increased abnorm abnormal nuclear degradation in the stratum conium, elongated red ridges. There, it has a phenocopy of human psoriasis. So we tested the effect, topical application of definidin on this mouse model. What we observed is that topical application, this is H&E, 
Topical application of this induce the expression of differentiation markers. This is control and this is dose dependent increase in the concentration of the drug. You see, compared to control, there is increase in the expression, increase in brown staining of the different differentiation markers. So psoriasis is an inflammatory skin disease, so it has an immune component. We also look at different immune uh, TH cytokine pathways that are very much incriminated in this disease, in this disorder. We observe a dose-dependent decrease in the expression or in the expression of, the, of these markers in the presence of uh, uh, definitely, even including the TH uh, interleukin-23 signaling pathway or the TH17 markers. They started telling us that we're shifting from differentiation to inflammation, and this compound is still having this kind of effect. What's the next question is, uh, in 2009, a recent mouse model came up, the imiquimod-induced mouse model, um, where imiquimod is a toll-like receptor 7 and 8 ligand, which is used in the clinic to treat some form of what uh, actinic keratosis as well as superficial basal cell carcinoma. But in normal skin or in patients who are prone to psoriasis, this drug has been shown to exacerbate the condition. <coughs> so um, in the animal model, it is used as it was used to test uh, a form of acute psoriasis, which it thus reproduces all the, almost all the phenotype of psoriasis. Human clinical psoriasis is reproduced in this model. Here you can see the inflammation. Uh, this is normal, normal mice, skin that is shaved, Papsi mice, you see the scale, the inflammation, and when you look at the histologic, histologic section, you see find uh, some of the characteristics that are uh, defined here. So we use this mouse model and designed experiment in three different cohorts, where uh, we either had a group that was treated with, with without imiquimod control, with imiquimod, or co-treated with both imiquimod and that. But what we did is that in most cancer studies, they do chemo prevention. What we did is, in this case is that we actually induced the disease and then started treating the disease with concomitant induction of the disease. That's a little bit different from what they do in cancer. You have to create or you have to do chemo prevention. So starting from day zero up to day three, mice were treated with, um, with imiquimod and up to uh, for, for six days and after six days, they were divided into different groups. One group just received constant imiquimod treatment, and the other group received both imiquimod and definidine, and the other one stayed without any treatment. But in the group that uh, had, were co-treated with imiquimod, with imiquimod and definidine, we applied definidine three hours before imiquimod during the co-treatment time. Following that, we used different technology um, to analyze the uh, ensuring effect of these treatments. And what we found is the first thing. I like showing pictures. If you look at this composite representative graph of control E of the mice, what do you see compared to this middle? The middle one is 14 days treated in Mikumod alone. First of all, here we see thickness compared to control, right? Skin thickness. The next thing you see a lot of scales and followed by erythema, the background of uh, erythematous background. The co-treated group shows a reversal of this phenotype towards control. And uh, skin sections show, ear and skin sections show increased thickness, increased red ridge, increased infiltration in imiquimod, as well as increased proliferation compared to control. And the co-treated group showed a reversal towards that, towards control. So this was not enough for us to make any conclusion. We then moved further to look at immunohistology, to study the different markers of differentiation, inflammation, infiltration. So uh, this is not really good for this. So here I'm going to take some time here because this was not. So here we see uh, differences. It's not very clear. You see the brown dots here are increased black brown dots in imicumor treated. And here you can see micro abscesses uh, and is present. Treatment, in, treatment with imicumor induce abnormally increase the expression of fatty acid binding protein loricrine as well as involucrine, which are normal differentiation markers. But this normal differentiation marker should be expressed at a certain level. It should not be expressed everywhere. That's crazy. So compared to control that is expressed at the epidemics, this disease expresses it almost all over. This is not good. And then the co-treated group showed normalization of this 
expression pattern. So we did some quantification that shows that it was statistically significant. Then we looked at the mTOR pathway. We also found that in this mouse model, here there is induction of the protein uh, expression. And we also showed the increased expression of these uh, pathway markers in the mouse model compared to control. And then we showed, therefore, that in the presence of these the, uh, co-treatment, there is decrease, almost complete decrease in the expression of these uh, markers in this. So I think it's time up. Uh, this was a little bit difficult. So one of the one of the good things that we're thinking about this um, natural compound is the route of administration, how we can protect the compound from being degraded in the wrong pathway, or even you want to take the compound through oral consumption. Should this compound be prepared and protected against certain things, such as enzyme, acidity of the stomach, to make it more efficacious in the organ, in the target system that we are. So there comes a new technology where we use green tea uh, polyphenol, EGCG, um, as a model to control this, but we use it as a nano formulation. Uh, nanotechnology is, some, is a technology that has been around since the early 1950s, but since the last 10 years it has been, it has rapidly increased and its application has increased. It's done in atomic molecular and macromolecular level that ranges from one to 100 nanometer, so it's less than the size of a virus, those particles, and they are used to create structures and device or system with novel properties. And in drug delivery system, this nanoparticle should be biodegradable so that when they reach the target system, the particle will be degraded and then that will release the excipient, the active ingredient or the drug at that local site. So uh, this compound has been used in a native state for decades to treat cancer. And 10 years ago, researchers from Georgia showed for the first time that on normal human keratinocyte on mouse skin that this compound can induce differentiation. So I resulted in this and we said that although this compound has shown good clinical efficacy, uh, good preclinical data, it has not been translated to fruition to clinical practice. So some of the reason could some of the reasons for this are maybe the diverse genetic background as us human, different food habits, and maybe the mode, the routes of administration, or the inefficient system delivery, as we've already said. So we generated, um, we circumvented this by just, uh, developing and characterizing a chitosan based, a plant based uh, biodegradable uh, material, encapsulating this with um, uh, molecular uh, size that range from less than 200 nanometer. After characterization, we showed that this compound on keratinocyte uh, decreased cell viability in the keratinocyte. We also showed its absorbance into the cell by treating them and harvesting the cell, washing them, lysing the cells, and quantifying them. To see, and we showed that in the, in the gray scale in this bar, there is increase in concentration of the active ingredient in the nanoformulated compound. So in this study, we found out that in vitro, there was fourfold dose advantage of nanoformulated compound over that of free compound. Then we move to the in vivo. We use topical application, use the same mouse model. And here we observe that uh, this is imikimod, we've seen this, imikimod treatment and then control. Here is free EGCG, co-treatment with free EGCG and nano EGCG. We see there was decrease in ear thickness, all the parameters, inflammation, scales, and then uh, histologically, we see the decrease in epidermal thickness. But you see that here, the epidermis is thicker here than here. That's not all. What we observe is that this one has 58 microgram of this compound encapsulated, whereas this is one milligram. So it is greater than 24 dose advantage. It is still less than the nat native one at a dose that is greater than 24 less so the nano delivery is also a model that we could, um, nanoparticle delivery is also another model that we could use to safely deliver drug for the therapeutic advantage in the system that we want. So we looked also at inflammatory uh, system, um, blood vessel formation. There is increase in this in imikimod, but you see that in both treatment there is down, uh, down, uh, down regulation of the expression. 
So I'm going to skip, skip this because of time. Uh, we've talked about this already in different portions. So we also have another compound that we've developed that is also found in fruits and vegetable, fisetin, and it's mostly found in strawberries, apples, persimmon, grapes. That is what I'm doing now. I'm trying to develop that compound also for the treatment of uh, psoriasis. And this compound, it tends to have an effect that it's antagonizing some of the effect of immune cell driven phenomenon. So when in psoriasis, which is a chronic condition, immune cells leave the blood vessels and come to the local site where there was chemo attractant. When they come there, they activate the secretion of cytokines and chemokines that will exacerbate the proliferation of keratinocyte. And then proliferation of keratinocyte would also auto exacerbate the secretion and maintain chronicity of the disease. So this compound seems to be a micromolar, a nanomolar drug, which have, we've shown that it does dose and time dependently increase expression of differentiation markers. It those dependently decrease the activation of this PI3, which we found in, in the mouse model. And also we see that just a 10 micromolar treated, this is not good. So here is the resting immune cells in culture. Here is activated with anti-CD3, and here is co-activation plus 5 c You see there's significant drop down in the expression of these uh, uh, cytokines. So in a nutshell, we think that exploiting the usefulness of natural compound will be, will, be, will be enough to start from the basic biology of the organism, not only in skin, any kind of disease. Then we translate that to understand what is happening when the cells of that tissue are tissue engineered, so they behave normally like in situ. That will be the effect short of the vasculature, that's the blood system. And then when you validate that, we can then proceed to the animal system that has vasculature. From there, if we confirm such analysis, then we can move to clinical trial. So these drugs can significantly curb the huge number of experimentation by doing tissue engineering, and it's required for preclinical pre drug development. And, and um, another important thing is that if somewhere in our investigation this drug end up to be toxic, what can we do? We can resynthesize analogs of the drug. That could be more potent than the, than the drug itself, or the compound, or the chemical itself. So there are plausible means in which we can do that, or we can nanoformulate the compound and direct them directly to the target organ. So this means that natural products such as this compounds that we have discussed and other compounds that are still yet to be identified uh, could, be, um, could be developed either alone or as adjuvants to current therapies. So we could use Definidine together with Casipotriol. We could use Definidine or EGCG, develop, uh, deliver them in an appropriate way with the different compounds that are known in clinic. Or they could be used um, differently or individually for the management of these diseases and then the preparation of the drug and the delivery of this compound in their pharmacologically active form is also very important. So in summary, I think that knowledge of molecular dermatology crossing down with skin pathology would, uh, in, in the presence of translational, translational research in dermatology at the interface of uh, the presence of bioactive natural product in any formulation, in any form, will significantly benefit patients in uh, patients suffering from dermatosis, dermatosis means skin conditions, skin diseases. So I would like to end this by acknowledging these people who have over the year assisted in producing all this work that I've summarized today. In this guy's lab, Dr. Hassan Mokta, I call it a fraternity. We see people working with different area, cancer, prostate cancer, and I really want to acknowledge my students over the, year, over the years who have contributed significantly to this work and members of uh, the Mukta's laboratory. Um, without the assistance of the head of the department and the dermatopathologist uh, in UW, this work would have ended in 2012. We also have collaborators. I'm collaborating now with immunologists from the Department of Medicine. 
We also had collaborators from different universities from Arizona and from Italy, the nano formulation, nanotechnology experts. And this work was, uh, has worked in my mentor's lab as well as my work since, the, since 20, uh, 2014 has been supported by the NIH Skin Disease Research Center and the American Skin uh, Association uh, grant. I would like to acknowledge the administrative services rendered by the administrator because without them, it would have been difficult to do administrative work and then go back and do bench work. They have contributed tremendously in this work, even though they are not co-authors in these publications. I want to thank them for this. And finally, I want to thank these people who have allowed me to get up from bed 1 a.m., 2 a.m. to go and monitor my animals or my rats or my experiments, my wife, the little guy who just made some demonstration a few minutes, he does that a lot. He's been doing this in our lab, and my, mo my mentor has decided to give him an office. <laughs> so, <laughs> with computers, he, can, he just come in and don't have my time, just move in there and start doing what they used to do. And I want to acknowledge also my two daughters who are also here today to see what's going. With this, um, I would like to thank you for this nice picture. Yes, please. Uh, the treatment that you're, you're talking about, as I understand it, if I understand it correctly, is that you're accelerating the differentiation of the keratinocytes uh, over what they, they normally are in the disease condition. Do you, do you uh, get them to differentiate more rapidly? Is that correct? So, yeah, uh, the goal, initially, the goal was to see that we see, you get a compound that will accelerate differentiation. So it could reduce the epidermal thinning, uh, increase epidermal thinning. Right. So it does that, and and more other things. My, my question is: uh, It's known that in HPV 16, the gene expressions are tied closely to the differentiation of the keratinocytes. Yeah. In fact, the final uh, capsid proteins are, are expressed uh, when, when the, uh, at the at the final stage of differentiation. Yeah. Uh, is there some hazard in applying this kind of treatment to somebody that has an HPV-16 infection that, that it just might cause a burst of uh, viral shedding? I think that is a very good question, and that is something I never thought of discussing with Paul Lambert. I am going to attack him anytime I meet him, but I would think that it is, it is hypothetically, it could be an application. But the, go the thing here is that it's the the viral genome. So the e HPV E6, E7 open reading frame is very aggressive. And you would say because of its hyperproliferative nature and the acanthosis that is found in the skin lesion that simulate that of HPV, uh, uh, the warts, I think in the first instant we would think it's yes, but it might be very complex. I, I, thank you for that question. I need to. That was a great question. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, that's something to think about. Yes, please. I was curious, and this is strictly just curiosity, did Delphinity retain any of the typical enzyme and coloration in your formulations? Yeah, um, in the formulation that we are currently doing, um, we see the blue color. And that has been a major problem in grants because of the color. So most of these compounds will retain their color. Even when you treat them, when you treat the cells, they change color. Even 5-13 does change color. So that has been a major problem with an NIH grant that I'm reviewing over and over and over and over. But we have an idea, an idea of how we can circumvent the issue of color. But that is only a problem when we do them topically, mostly. Yeah, because some of those compounds, like the color changes will determine what happens with ketonous, ketonous, sorry. I, I'm finding it very difficult to break this language down. With skin toxicity, ketonous toxicity, skin toxicity, especially yellow compounds. So um, we might benefit from using different delivery approaches. Curcumin is used. Curcumin, uh, the turmeric, is currently has, I think it's going to clinical, clinical practice now. I was very happy last month when I saw the, that work. 
I was like, this is more yellow than my compound. So we want to find out what is happening. The, the, the goal is collaborating. You know, this is science and even medicine is, you, you do dermatology, you have people with different biochemistry and so on. When we bring heads together, we can do things better. And I think that is what I need to do with this compound. I need to talk with synthetic chemists and people who are good at formulation to see if we can formulate compounds that are not colored. But yes, all definitely in stain blue. And there is a comp company in Europe, in Switzerland, that uh, contacted my mentor, and we are trying to design something for aging. And uh, they've shown that it's very good. It's clinical, an um, anti-aging compound. They call it Delphinol. So they want us to find out what is happening with the dermal epidermal components of the human skin. So we want to start doing that using tissue-engineered human skin then before we can go to the mouse, because in the U.S. it's very strict. It's not like U.S. encourages animal um, studies a lot. And um, in Europe also, they want you to first do animal uh, replacement experiment before you do them. Yes, please. Does uh, Botox treatment, uh, does it have anything to do in terms of treatment? Or psoriasis, uh, another thing, if you have a psoriasis patient, and uh, I'm just hypothesizing, yeah. if it's a biracial patient, yeah. have you studied the offspring and studied their DNA and see if they are also candidates for psoriasis? Oh, you mean candidate gene if they are genetically? No, if a psoriasis patient, say a Caucasian, yeah. Uh, yeah. man is a non-Caucasian, yeah. have you studied the, the offspring? to see if they become also psoriasis candidates, or if they don't, it, have you taken the biopsy of their skin and then done some research as to... So we, we, haven't, we haven't done that. It is because it's just now that uh, recent studies are showing that this is affecting children also. So a couple of years ago, we always say said the IRB said uh, cutoff was 18 years. But there have been about two, three reports now that shows 12 years. So I think that is the reason why these kind of studies have not been encouraged in the past. But this is something that should be encouraged now. But psoriasis has been shown to have some genetic susceptibility, susceptibility um, regions and in uh, it, it form of acquire, um, the way they acquire the disease also. But the most uh, predominant thing we see is that when it's already advanced in when you already grow as adults, then anything can trigger it. So if you are susceptible, any small injury can trigger that cytokine profile and then induces a lot of cell growth and so on. It could be exacerbated. So there are two major susceptibility lo locus that are known, but I haven't seen studies that have done that in the population and then gone down to study the family. And it, it might be a little bit difficult in the U.S. because to get these clinical samples is tough. Regulations, yeah. You mentioned nano treatment, and I saw it. Nanotherapy, yes, please. Uh, I saw a picture of a woman who had uh, psoriasis all over. Yeah. So I guess you cannot have really a targeted nano uh, treatment because it's all over. So yeah, so, so the... The goal could be to prepare a formulation that could be applied. And, and the goal of the nano would be that EGCG, for instance, what I didn't explain that because of time, there was a lot of th things that we could have done. But EGCG, for instance, um, they, these compounds, they do have very short half-life, right? So if you do a nano formulation that could provide sustained release, it could give time boosting of the efficacy of the drug. That's the major goal for that to be done uh, topically. Otherwise, it's at the, at the local area. Why use nano when, when you can just apply the, the drug there? So we've done some uh, studies during the reviewing of this paper that showed us that it is not only the application at the local side, it is a retention time on the skin. So we did some uh, targeting with fit, uh, with SIPE, and we showed that throughout 24 hours, they go down 
we could monitor the fluorescence. They go down in the different layers of the skin. And that is why we found some of the results very um, puzzling when we found out that they were splenomegaly was decreased. So we found out that after a long uh, uh, multiple application, it increases the down and then it could get towards the blood vessel and that's why you see what's happening in the, in the spleen and in other organs. <coughs> Yes, yes, please. Okay. I, does that answer your question, or do you have some... What I mentioned about Botox. The Botox therapy. Yeah, um, I think anything <laughs> clinically that has been shown, especially in, in different kind of diseases, such as Botox have been used. We've used them in the past when I was working with <coughs> general dermatosis. It could be applicable to psoriasis, because psoriasis is very heady, especially in the severe cases that we, we've seen. But the mechanism need to be well, very well investigated in the different disease. And as to the best of my knowledge, I have not yet seen it. Uh, maybe I missed it, but I have not come across uh, that application. Do you know if there is any clinical work that has been done with Botox on the disease? No. Yeah, because I've seen them mostly on genetic skin diseases, but the mechanism is still really, it could be extrapolated or could be carried over. Like some of these compounds, they are very well known in cancer. Yes, please. I wonder if in your in vitro experiments, have you also looked at diagnostic methodologies for earlier detection? That is almost similar to his question. And, and, and the, the major problem with the disease is that recently, a lot of things have been reinventing themselves in the disease. Uh, in the past, they have focused on families and different families and how they acquire this. So they have not really developed a means, but the techniques for diagnosis are available. Then they need to organize a study. No, I've not seen studies that have done that. Especially um, recently we came from the society meeting, there was a lot of questions, even the recent question, why is it that psoriasis cannot become cancer? It's very abnormal. So those are many puzzling questions that dermatologists and uh, scientists are looking into to uh, ways to look at how we can prop into that. So the, the techniques are available, but it's not applicable yet, except something I haven't come, come across yet. So yes, yes, please. Yeah, of course. And they're dropping off insurance pens because they've gotten so expensive. And so I'm open to all kinds of things these days. So, you know, even, you know, the phototherapy and things like that. that Sorry, then. Outside. Now, as a, um, knowing what you know now, if I increase my diet of the fruits and vegetables that you have on the screen, if I uh, increase my uh, green tea intake or I don't think you can do anything worse, but what I think is that most of these fruits and vegetables we consume, they go through the stomach. No, I don't think so. I think that you need to consume it in, in, in this fashion that should be like a habit. Like you eat every day, right? If you can get them, then just like uh, our colleague said, that why is it that we will use nano when something is exposed to the skin and we can just dump it on it? And then we discuss about the release, right? So I would think that many people say, oh, I drink this thing a lot. Just make a certain habit and just keep it up. Because many people are perplexed with, when you see patients, they keep complaining. I have done this, it's not working. The, the truth is, if you make a habit of fruits are very expensive, if you really make a habit of consuming those fruits in an alternate fashion, not like one month I will consume all strawberries in Madison. <laughs> <laughs> right? Hey, it's work. Yeah. So if we can make a habit like 
I can eat strawberry, two pieces of strawberry, instead of 10 a day, once in 10 days, I can split that 10 in a fashion that I can take it every day. I think this will help our habit because they help our children. They help us grow. They give us all the cofactors, all the vitamins that we need when we were growing. Why shouldn't that work now? It's because we have grown up as adults. We are paying a lot of bills. We don't have time. I'm sorry, my wife is here. We don't have time to eat. We are chasing results or we are chasing dollars, and then we don't have a good chronometry. I think it's difficult. Even I myself, I'm saying this, but my wife may just interject and say, you don't, you don't do what you advise, but I think that if we now have this condition, we can make our goal and go constantly. If it is converted in the system, you can still get something constantly. That will be enough in the long run. Uh, does somebody have something to add on that? If I any idea. Because I think they do work. It's just that the liver is doing something. You don't need to put raw fruit on your skin. I don't, I don't think. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, I think if I heard correctly, this is some psoriasis. Uh, you can call it anyhow. I will understand. Psoriasis <laughs> um, primarily affects Caucasians. Do yeah. you understand why, what the structure of non-Caucasian skin is why does it not affect Africans? Africans? Yeah. Um, Do we know that? Or? The gospel truth is, the gospel truth is, where Caucasians live, medical technology is more advanced. Medical practice is more advanced. Can we agree that if they say that it rarely affects African, is it true? Is the medical technology in African countries, is it really as advanced as the one we have here? Do we have registry in those developing countries? I start with that question. Um, then I think that is a. You're just saying we don't really know. We don't have good data everywhere Yeah, I'm sorry for using that word, but that's textbook word that is. But that's the truth now that we're discussing it. And then the other thing is that because they have done these advanced studies and they have grouped it in different groups, like Chinese, there are a lot of a huge cohort of Chinese that do have the HLA um, uh, genes, the GYs show that they do have. So that is because in that area, they were very advanced in it. So I, I, I believe that I come from, I have a perspective of all of this. So when we read textbooks, I would like to say that we should not put things the way they are in that context because it really scares us when we look at the statistics. But when we look at about the numbers coming up, I grew up in Cameroon. I don't know any patient who is registered in any health registry. And let me talk about Cameroon. I've been in some nine countries in Africa. And we just pick people randomly in the street and they just tell a story. And the story is what is told. And you know, stories, personalized stories is almost 25% true. <laughs> is that what are we is that what we are we are going to base on? compared to here when a baby is born, the baby enters the registry, the baby is screened from the day he or she is born, and it gets into a registry, and then you can go on a birth registry and collect data, spread it out in statistics. Even the statistics is not advanced in Africa. So I, I would advise that we, except things like HIV AIDS, um, uh, that is hot kick that we hit directly, and people can count and see and study quickly. Some of these, our conditions are different. Um, I, I will be in the future trying to work with researchers in Africa to see what's happening. Because I've been to Africa and I've seen some, some skin conditions that could be, um, you know, only molecular diagnosis can say. But I think there are a lot of things we see we don't have here that we do have. Um, in 2009, I was in Nigeria where I was called to consult in a group, and we found EB in one patient, and it was screened, electron microscopy, even gene mutation came out, and that was very strange. So if those things can, as we are advancing with medical technologies today, boundaries in terms of regional distribution will really be unlocked. But our major problem is the information from developing world, and the way we interpret them. So, I think that if we have the Caucasian, it's because I'm not, I may not be right. Maybe someone has read something about 
these kind of studies, but I really, when I get these GWAS studies and they say, compared to this, it's like, how was that study compared to? How was this um, cohort of the study done in these regions? I do understand there are some genetic diseases such as keloid that I show. That is, um, it's only to dark-skinned people. Then it's genetic because there is abnormal growth of um, dermal collagen, uh, fibroblasts that exacerbate secretion of collagen. That is well known. In Center for Disease Control and in, in, in places like in UK, there are serious clinician scientists who have shown that and it's proven. There are genetic data, even in uh, UT Texas, the guy who got that prize, they have shown a clear-cut genetic content that um, people from dark skin family may be genetically prone to hyper uh, proliferation of collagen, but only when the skin has been provoked. Just like when you, if you come from a family that is susceptible to some of these genetic um, conditions for psoriasis, uh, you may live all your life without seeing any, any lesion. But some people, when you do like the athletes, the work in farms, you do some, you know, um, fiscal work that require your skin bumping on things, you can get injury that can trigger it. And then from there, you start seeing it. But you may not know if you don't go for diagnosis. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much.